If I die, someone please upload this video. No days off. What's going on everyone? Back with another episode of Stuff and Things. Today I want to talk about ski boarding. If you don't know what it is, you probably will by the end of this video. Also, if you have not, like search back through old videos on my channel. I will leave a playlist right here all about ski boarding. It is getting into winter here in the Northeast and we should be seeing snow hopefully soon, maybe just after the new year. And in the past, I would typically get all of my ski boarding stuff ready in like October because I was so stoked and I really had nothing else to look forward to. It's the beginning of December now and I haven't even touched my stuff. I actually have to dig it out of all of my different places that I keep it, like in the basement and out in the garage. So I'm gonna bring you guys with me. You might see some other stuff that you might be interested in and I could make future videos on it, but yeah, let's go hunt for some ski boarding gear. First, we're coming down here to the basement, which is a wreck because of all of the Christmas decorations that have been taken out of here. I have some old guitars laying here mandolin, ukulele, the first guitar that I ever learned on. That was my great, great grandfather's. And here are my old ski boots, but these are my newer ones. Take these upstairs. And for the next thing, I'm coming out to the garage because I think my ski boards are out here. Ooh, that is bright. They're up there somewhere. This is dangerous. There's some skateboards. It's like a skateboard graveyard back here. Some push ones, some electric ones, lots of electric ones. Golf clubs and a dart board. And here are my ski boards. I'm basically just going to grab a stack of these so we can talk about the different models and the different features that each of them have. These are super old. These things are super dope. Uh, what else? These two pairs. Ugh. I can't get this out of here. Is this gonna fall off of here? It's probably gonna fall off of here. Here are the boards that I actually have been riding. I'm gonna take one pair of old boards too, just for a sort of comparison. Typically I'm a one trip type of guy when it comes to groceries, but I do not want to fall off of here and die carrying these down. Whoa, this is sketchy. If I die, someone please upload this video. No days off. All right, let's go inside. All right, we got everything set up here. Now let's get into what ski boarding actually is. These, as you see, you may already know, these are ski boards, not ski blades, not snow blades, ski boards, one word. I have been riding for the company who makes these Revelate ski boards for a while now. And while there are other ski board brands out there, this one definitely takes the cake for most riders here in America. They sell the most boards, they have the most options, and in my opinion, it is definitely the most high quality board out there, as well as many other people's opinions. So what makes these high quality is basically the construction of them because it is similar to that of a snowboard or a ski. There are two of them, so you are rocking one on each foot like skis, but they are shaped like snowboards. They're extra wide and fat. They are all wood core. They have metal inserts on the top here for mounting up different binding options, which we will get to in a second. And these are also sidewall construction, so if you know the difference between this and a cap construction, then there you go. Now you might be thinking, hmm, that's kind of weird and a different design. Where can you actually ride these things? I've said this before and I will say it again. You can ride ski boards literally anywhere, on any terrain, on any mountain. This set of boards specifically has seen mountains all over the country and some parking lots too and some rails here and there on some urban environments. These are definitely battle-worn. They've seen their better days, but these things can tackle everything. Whether you're just a weekend warrior and you like cruising down some groomers, Or maybe you get a little bit adventurous and you sneak off into the trees. Yeah. 
Yes, they are short, but because a lot of the models are wide, you can also ride these in very deep powder. Every rider's abilities are obviously different, but I'm telling you, I can take these things literally anywhere that you can take skis or a snowboard. Now we can talk a little bit about the stereotypes of ski boards. A lot of people are like, why don't you just ski or why don't you just snowboard? And a simple answer for that is just because ski boarding is way more fun. And then that is typically countered by, oh, but you can't go fast because they're so short. That is the furthest thing from the truth. We actually have video evidence of us going about like 75, 80 miles an hour last year in Tahoe. A lot of people like to challenge us on things like this in the comments section. And I guarantee you, we have not been beaten by any skier or snowboard. So you can tuck down very low and these things when waxed and taken care of correctly are very very fast Let's check out some other boards too. These are the first ski boards that I ever started on They're actually made by line who now makes skis and these are the Mike Nick pros back when Ski boarding was actually in the X Games before twin tip skis were so a lot of people say oh They're so short you can't do tricks on them because you don't have anything to land on while that is kind of true It is definitely much harder to land on ski boards than it is to land on a set of skis or a snowboard You can do literally any trick on ski boards that you can do on skis and for the most part you can spin a lot faster you can switch up on rails way quicker when it comes to sticking the landings on very big jumps you obviously don't have a lot of room if you're landing switch you don't have a nose to kind of lean on or if you're landing very far back seat you don't have much of a tail to kind of support yourself with but if you watch the videos in that playlist you will see us doing all sorts of stuff with ski boards I have said this before and I will say it again if there is anyone who wants to challenge us to any kind of competition whether it's speed or tricks or anything like that I'm always posting on Instagram which mountains we are riding at for the weekend. Early season we will most likely be all over the east coast but then later in the year we will probably head out west maybe to Colorado, definitely California and where else? Basically anywhere around Tahoe I guess. Now these are apparently the boards that I was riding during last season because the bindings are still on here. So while I have these up here, let's talk about the actual binding options. So there are a few different binding options when it comes to mounting them on ski boards. My preferred binding choice is obviously a non-release binding just like this. These are receptors also made by Revelate Ski Boards. These are some of the best bindings out there right now, but there are also some older models that you could possibly find. Like these Zero Pros, I don't even know when these were made, probably in the early 2000s, maybe even the late 90s. They all still work the same, and as long as you take care of them and keep them kind of rust free, then chances are they're gonna last you a long time. Now the way the non-release bindings work is a very simple. I am just using a traditional ski boot. These are full tilt classics and boot choice really doesn't matter here. As long as it is a normal ski boot, they will work. You put your foot on the binding just like this. You flip up the heel piece, which sits on the back of the boot. And now this is going to be very difficult to do one-handed because I ride with my bindings super tight. But you then lift up the toe bail and then crank it down here on the nose of the boot. Now this thing is on here. There is no way that this is coming off even with a 175, 180 pound rider like myself. I run my bindings this way because I also don't like using leashes. A leash is something that simply clips around one of the bales, either the heel or the toe bail, and then it goes around your boot. That way, if for some reason the board does pop off of your boot, it's not gonna go shooting down the mountain. A lot of mountains don't let you ride with non-release bindings like this, especially if you don't have leashes, but for the most part, it's like a don't ask, don't tell type of thing. So the reason that I ride non-release bindings is because it keeps you closer to the board. Being closer to the board gives you a little bit better stability. You can feel the board a lot more, especially when you're on rails and you're feeling out edges. And I'm using a non-release binding as opposed to a standard release binding that you would find on a normal pair of skis. The thing with using a release binding that you would normally find on a pair of skis is that there are inserts on the boards. Let me grab one that actually doesn't have a binding on it. These are the Revel 8 Kirk Thompson Pro models. This specific model, as you can see here, has one, two, three different positions that you can mount the binding to the board. If you want the binding directly center, you can mount it right over here, or if you want it set back a little bit because you're going to be riding in some like waist-deep powder, you can also do that and get a little bit more float under the nose. 
So the reason that you do not see inserts drilled in here for release bindings is because if you have your boot flat up against this board, it's going to throw off the flex, the carving. Could you do it? Yes, but it's really recommended that you do not drill into these. Instead, right now, the most popular option would be a spruce riser, which takes up these four holes here. And then basically it's just a metal bracket that kind of lifts the boot up off the board. And then you can mount the normal release bindings in front and rear. When you're using something like that, you may have to get extended brakes if you're just using a traditional brake system, because obviously the boards are very wide. You need that brake to be extended that way when they do release, then it's going to be able to clear the board and it's not just going to sit on the top sheet. Release bindings would be good for a situation where maybe you are not the most aggressive rider, you're not in the park and you're worried about injuries. Riding with a non-release binding like this is definitely dangerous. If I'm coming down really hard off of a jump or I get tangled up in the trees or something, these things are not coming off my feet. So I have really practiced and basically trained myself on how to fall because I know that these things are gonna be banging around and they are connected to my legs, they're not coming off. So when I get asked questions like, hey, what type of binding setup should I use on my boards? It is very, very much a personal preference, just like anything else, especially the boards too. You really have to assess the situation for yourself. I cannot give you a solid recommendation. All I can give you is this knowledge and then you will have to make all of those decisions for yourself. So for someone like myself, who is a very aggressive rider, I'm in the park all the time. I'm riding these things all over the mountain, using and abusing them to their max potential. I personally like the non-release receptor bindings. Like I said, because it keeps you closer to the board, it is very stiff then, so it gives you a nice feeling of the edges when you're on rails. I don't want these things coming off at all, so I take my heel and toe bail and kind of bring them in as close as possible which makes the toe bail really hard to put on, obviously, but that is just the way that I like my setup. Also with the Revelate boards and the receptor bindings, you saw the different inserts in the actual board itself. There are also little micro adjustments here inside of the binding. So if you want it set back even further or maybe not set back so much by using the back inserts, you can position the binding differently depending on where you put the hardware through these holes. If you've ever put bindings on your boards like this, it would make sense to you. So hopefully that helps some of you out there. You could also talk about the different riser pads underneath here. These are just the ones that come with the receptors. Some people like to add bigger, thicker risers for more cushion. I am personally fine with riding them how they come stock. But the one thing that you do not want to do is mount your binding directly to the board. That is going to make this thing way too rigid and there's a very good chance that you could snap your actual ski boards when doing that. A release binding would really be good for someone who is not so aggressive. One thing with the risers is that it keeps you way higher off the board when compared to a non-release binding. What that would be good for is getting a little bit more leverage to get the board up on your edges. So if you're really into carving groomers and stuff like that, that might be a good option for you. They are also going to be safer, so if you are an older rider and you want to save your knees, that would be a good option to go with as well. I personally have tried riding with non-release bindings in the past and it just really wasn't for me. I don't like how high you sit up off the board. Board. And I also don't really like the added weight. These are obviously going to be a lot lighter because it is just the metal bracket. It's not a big chunk of metal with more bindings mounted on top of it. So this keeps things nice and simple and yeah, that's why I ride non-release bindings. There is actually one more binding option and that would actually be the use of snowboard bindings on ski boards. Revelate makes these risers where you can mount pretty much any kind of a soft snowboard boot binding onto the boards. The thing with that though is that you really need more ankle support. So Revelate actually has bindings that come across the front of your shin. Obviously with a regular soft boot and a snowboard binding, you're going to be able to flex back and forth but when it comes to controlling two different ski boards at one time you definitely want to have that rigidity and that is why I use ski boots. I have personally never ridden a soft boot setup but my friend Dave has and he sort of said the same thing we both ride very similar very aggressive and in the park and a soft boot like that doesn't quite give you the same kind of feeling that a ski boot does. When I have my ski boots on and I'm in a non-release binding like this on a very stiff board like the KTP, basically everything from my knee down is one solid piece. It keeps things very, very responsive and tight on my foot, and that's what allows me to do some of the things that you see us do. A soft boot might be good for someone who just can't stand their feet being in ski boots, but at the same time, because there is that little bit of flex, you're not going to have the same type of responsiveness as you would with a traditional ski boot. So now let's talk about boards too, because that is one of the questions that I get asked the most. They say, hey, I am this type of person, this height, this weight, what kind of board should I get? Again, this is something that is very rider dependent, depending on what mountain they ride at, what their style of riding is, if they're in the park, if they're on groomers, if they're in powder. 
There are a bunch of different options and basically all of the boards can do the same thing, but there are some boards that are more directed towards like strictly powder riding and other ones are directed more towards park riding. I specifically ride the KTPs because for me, it is the best board that is like a jack of all trades. They are 101 centimeters, so they are super maneuverable. These models specifically are also super, super rigid. This is probably one of the stiffest boards that Revel 8 makes and that is something that I like. Like I said, the stiffer the board is, the more solid your foot is on here, the more responsive it's actually going to be when you're riding. These boards are also kind of mid-range to higher range wide when you compare them against the rest of the lineup. That wide board coupled with the different inserts of both inside the board and then the different positions on the bindings, that's gonna allow you to set these things up for powder riding if that's what you wanna do. If this is the only board that I have and I want to ride some really deep stuff, I can set the bindings back either in the inserts or on the actual bindings themselves. And like I said, I've taken these boards everywhere in a very deep powder and they perform every single time. So this is actually the board that I would recommend for someone who rides similar to myself, very aggressive all over the mountain, definitely in the park a lot. I would say if you classify yourself as being not that aggressive of a rider, I would switch to something with a little bit narrower underfoot. One thing about these boards is that when you want to get them up on edge, you really have to lean to get them up there because they're so wide. If you go with a little bit narrower of a board like this DLP right here, as you can see on the underfoot, this one is definitely a lot skinnier than the KTP. And then that means as you are riding down the hill, it is not going to take as much torque to get yourself up on that edge and make a carve. These are 110 centimeters, so they are a little bit longer. Technically, you're going to have more room to land off of jumps or just kind of keep your stability up with these. These things are still pretty wide like most ski boards are, so you can definitely ride these things in powder, but you're not going to get as much float as you would with a wider board. If you have the option to, you can set the bindings back like I said. And this is actually my friend Dave's go-to choice of board. This is his pro model, the DLP. But Talon, where's your pro model? I do not have a pro model because I think Kirk Thompson's board is like the perfect board. If I ever were to have one, it would definitely be this one. But there's really no point in making another model just for myself when these work perfectly. Perfectly. Every different model that comes out, whether it is a pro model or just a regular model of ski board, there is something a little bit added to it, whether it's the design, something that's a little bit wider, something that flexes more. Speaking of that, these are obviously going to be a little bit more flexy than the KTPs because they are longer. But yeah, this would be another good all around board if you're looking to just kind of do a little bit of everything. Now let's move on to something that is good for very deep powder. These are the Revelate Condors. Woo. Got it backwards. This board, if you didn't know any better and you only saw one of them, you would probably think that it is a snowboard because this thing is so wide. This is the same length as the DLP. There are standard inserts in this one as well, so you're not going to have to set your bindings back. That may be different depending on which boards you go with and which year they came out. But the reason you don't have to set these boards back is because they are so wide. You set your binding directly in the center here and these things are going to float over anything. These are a little bit more flexy than the DLPs. And for me, if you're asking my opinion, this would definitely be a dedicated powder board. I have ridden these before. I've ridden them all over the place. I've ridden them in the park, on groomers, in waist deep powder, which these are obviously very good for. But I would not recommend this board unless you are riding powder very frequently. With a super wide underfoot like this, it is obviously going to take a lot more pressure to get them up on their edges. It can definitely be done. Basically all of these boards can be put into any role that you want them to be. But these things are obviously more fit for powder. Now, if you really like the length of these boards and the width, the profile and everything, you can definitely ride these all around the mountain, but if you want something that is even more driven towards powder than the Condors, you could get a pair of rockered Condors like these. So here's the standard set. As you can see, it is relatively flat all the way across. There's a little bit of rise here in the middle. Obviously, that's just the way the boards are constructed. But a rockered board, something like this, as you can see, are very flat underneath the underfoot. And then there's some rise both in the front and the rear. This also makes the board a little bit slimmer. So these are super flexy and these are going to be your go-to powder board. In my opinion, for my style of riding, these are actually too flexy for me. When you're riding these on groomers or just anything that is not waist deep powder, this board actually feels more like a 75 centimeter board rather than 110. Because your underfoot is so small, basically this is the only part that is touching the snow. With the rise of both your tip and tail, when you get up on your edge, you're really only touching this much of the edge to the snow surface, and these are kind of just floating up in the air. So if you really want to ride powder, you live at a mountain like Squaw Valley. If Squaw Valley is your home mountain and you're riding waist deep powder all the time, 
these are the boards to go with. If you like the shape and profile of these, but you're riding on groomers more of the time, then a traditional regular Condor like this would probably be your best bet. And now speaking of rocker boards, we'll move on to the last board. These are the Blunt XLs. The best way that I could compare these two, basically if a standard Condor was like a DLP, this would be the rockered counterpart of that board. This is a standard KTP and the Blunt XL would basically be like the rockered counterpart to this board. Now the Blunt XL is definitely going to be much, much wider than the KTP and also much flexier too. Like I said, it has that same sort of profile so your underfoot is going to be a lot less than the actual overall length of the board. When you get up on your edges, of the board is going to be digging into the snow so they are super maneuverable and that flex and width definitely allows you to glide over snow so again if you are looking for a powder board but you don't want something quite as long as the 110 condors then the blunt xls might be a good option for you now there are a lot of different options that i really did not cover here you'll have to check out revelate's website to see everything that they offer but just keep in mind some of that basic stuff if you are in the market for ski boards typically the wider they are the better they are going to float in deep powder the skinnier the underfoot is, the easier it's going to be to get up on edge and kind of make really tight carves. If you're looking at boards that are rockered like this, the underfoot is going to feel a lot smaller than the actual overall length of the board is. And that rockered profile is going to allow you to float in very deep powder. Now another thing that I could sort of hit on is how you maintain boards like this. I'm really not the person to talk to about this because I treat my boards like tools because they are tools to me. Here is one of my KTPs that I have ridden very hard all over the country, like I said, through parking lots, and I'm doing stuff with these boards that you really should not do. Got it, nailed it, perfect. 10 out of 10. Don't go sliding down rock faces of cliffs and bang these things up in the trees and all sorts of stuff like that. You can do that. They're definitely going to be able to kind of stand up to that abuse. But at the same time, when I'm doing stuff like that, I'm using them to film funny and entertaining content. As you can see, the top sheets are a little bit nicked up and a lot of people, they see that and they're like, oh my God, my boards are ruined. No, they're not, it's just cosmetic. If you ride with a cap construction board like these Line Mic Nick Pros, these are obviously going to be a little bit more resistant to getting those chips in the top sheets. One thing that people do with a sidewall construction board like this to try to avoid that is basically chamfer the top edge. I've seen people take files and sort of round off the edges. That way, if you nick your boards together, the edge hopefully will kind of deflect off rather than just sticking in and taking little chunks out. Don't worry about your boards so much. They're gonna be fine. Even if they are a little bit nicked up like this, they still look really cool. It's like Boba Fetted. They're all kind of like battle worn. But this is still a board that I can use today. There is no cracks in the sidewall or the edges. These edges are very, very rusty and worn down, but the worn downness of the edges is actually something that I like. It's gonna be very hard to see on video here, but the edges are really rounded over and that's because I'm sliding on metal rails every chance that I get. The bases have also seen better days too, but basically I could tune these things up and make them almost good as new. You can wax the boards exactly how you would a snowboard or skis. You can tune the edges the same exact way as well. Basically the only thing I do for a season prep or like a mid season tune up is just throw some wax on here. As long as conditions are good, these bases will hold up and remain pretty dang fast. Like I keep saying, I use and abuse these things and they really have not failed me. So that was a lot of different information all at once, but I think that basically covers all of the typical questions that I get asked about ski boarding. Again, if you are looking for a ski board setup like this, basically I would just kind of go through the information on the website, use the information that I just gave you as well and basically make an educated decision. If you're going to ask me, I am this weight, I'm this height, this is the type of riding I do, nine times out of 10, I will just tell you to get KTPs. That's what I ride, it's like a jack of all trades and that is just what I prefer. If you ask Dave that same question, he's going to say ride his board, the DLP. You can push these boards into basically any role that you want them to be and they're going to work. The only thing that I would caution, like I said, is the rocker boards. I would really recommend only getting those if you are riding powder pretty consistently. Yes, you can ride them on groomers. Yes, you could ride them in the park if you wanted to. I personally would not do that. But yeah, it's all personal preference, the rider's abilities. Make an educated decision and hopefully you guys will go out there and shred some gnar. Shred some gnar, bro. All right, so that's all that I had 
about ski boarding. That's really all that I had for today. As soon as we get some snowfall here, I'm definitely going to be getting out and hopefully we can make a lot of videos like we did in some previous seasons. If you guys wanna check out Revel 8 stuff and basically everything that I showed here, I will of course leave the relevant links in the description down below. I also have a discount code for anyone who wants to place an order for these boards through skiboardsonline.com and you can find that in the description as well. So I think that's all that I had for today. I know this turned into more of like a product information, speech, talk type of thing, but whatever. Hopefully you guys learned something and found it somewhat entertaining. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments down below or hit me up on Instagram. Now, if you are new to the channel, consider clicking subscribe. I make new videos every week. That's gonna be all for today. So as always, thank you guys for watching. I'll talk to you tomorrow.